Thank you, Mayor Landrieu. And now I want to bring up my friend John Powell. Hello. John Powell with the Haas Institute for Just and Fair Society. Or is it fair and just? <laughs> fair and just. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm so glad you are here. Just, I'm glad you are here, period, yeah. so that we can enjoy this summit together. And I'm glad you're here to help us get into this conversation about solidarity, because John has really been, uh, he's devoted his life to it. Yeah. But more recently, he has found a frame for it that has just drawn so many people in, talking about othering and belonging, and how much of our lives are really impacted by how we approach those things. And so I thought it would be fun to talk with you before we have this panel on solidarity. And we sat together, he stayed the whole time I had to leave, in a strategy session where people, some of you here, a couple of hundred of you, talked a little about solidarity. And I thought I'd start by asking you what you took out of that conversation and then ask you to talk about what you hope we'll all take with us as we try to build solidarity to achieve what it is that we agree we want to achieve, but with so much nuance, so many tactics, so many issues, so many, um, so many movements within the movement that don't quite see themselves in a movement that is overarching, that keep us from being able to get there. John Powell. Well, thank you, and it's great to be here uh, with all of you, and especially with Angela and PolicyLink. Um, so in the session that I was in, we had a conversation about solidarity. And to some extent, people struggle with it. First of all, just defining it. Uh, they talk about solidarity, someone having your back, mm -hmm. um, someone that you can rely on in hard times. And then the facilitators move the question to, uh, have you ever been in a situation where you were, solidarity wasn't there? And people talked about that. Uh, and then maybe the more interesting question was, um, so imagine solidarity, radical imagination. How would you take a difficult issue and how would you parse that in terms of solidarity? And uh, people talked about um, uh, being in mixed race families where there was tension and how they would start to sort of shift into that tension. Mm -hmm. uh, some, someone talked about progressives need to take a bike ride uphill to get a sense, or maybe not just progressive, but all of us, right? So you see how hard this work is. Mm. You know, going downhill is kind of easy, you can coast. Going uphill, you never get to coast. You never get to take a break. Mm -hmm. So to, you know, um, bike in my shoes, if you will. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But then some people, and a lot of it was around race, not all of it, but most of it. Some people basically said, when I think about solidarity, specifically with white people, I don't see it. And I need help with that, because I don't see it happening. Uh, so people sort of named it, even after talking about solidarity, basically said, this is a heavy lift. I don't really see solidarity with white people. Um, and then finally, there were some people who said, we got to first work in our own communities and then have solidarity. So um, most people talked about it on an interpersonal level. <coughs> not so much on a structural, mm -hmm. institutional level. Um, and, um, and there was a, a sense of need, but there wasn't a clear sense of a pathway to get there. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was my impression of the conversation. I was there for just a little of it, and I was struck by the personal. I was struck by the personal. And because I'm always thinking about organizations and change and systems, I don't spend as much time talking about the personal, though I think I'm always personally working on myself. And it, I actually had this thought, John, when I was sitting there, whether I should be more deliberate about the personal work I do on myself and not jump so quickly to organization and systems and struggle and campaigns. Do you have a thought about that? I do. A couple of things. First of all, um, uh, I want to find out if you gave Fred back his diploma. I had to, because he had to go to college. All right, good, good. good. <laughs> um, so 
So those of you who followed uh, <laughs> my work, and my work is really Angela's work, we sometimes slightly reframe our, our work, but when I do my work, I call on Angela, and when she does the work, <laughs> she calls on me. So I had it at the Othering and Belonging Conference. And mm. there's a podcast out, out now, a lot of people talking about Othering and Belonging, and, and you'll see why I mentioned Fred. Um, the, the, um, the podcast talks about what happens when you don't belong in your own family. Mm. Uh, so there are places, so the personal is, is important. Um, the South African uh, Zulu word is sabawanu, as, as talked about by uh, Alvin Herring, who's the new head of PICO. Um, and sabawanu means I see you. Mm -hmm. Not I'm looking at you. Not I'm following you around the store to see what you're going to take. <laughs> <laughs> it means I see you. And it means I see you, I see your ancestors before you, and I see your children and your lineage after you. And the response is, I am here. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reality is that happens at multiple levels. And I think we can sort of fall into just working at the institutional level that can be important but a little cold. Mm -hmm. Or we can fall into working at the personal level uh, that can feel warm but doesn't get to scale. So really, mm -hmm. there's a dialectic between those two. Um, and, and they inform each other in some powerful ways. And I just don't have time to go into a great deal of things, but I'll leave you with this. Oh, you don't have to wrap up. OK. <laughs> I was going to say more later. Uh, the, the, the unconscious, which is big and fast, uh, there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And there's another book called Behave. Those are two books I'd recommend. Uh, the unconscious is big, I mean really big, and, and, and really fast. And the conscious is really small, mm -hmm. really small. This is, by some accounts, the unconscious processes 11 million bits of information a second, 11 million, while the conscious, in that same second, processes 40. Mm. Now, here's the thing, the unconscious is profoundly social. It's not individual. Mm -hmm. So when we look at all this mm -hmm. implicit bias, we actually, implicit bias come from the society and structure. It's not personal. And we actually confuse that. We think it is personal. Mm -hmm. The conscious is what's personal, but the conscious is actually very small. And a lot of neuroscientists say the conscious is a fraud. Mm. Because what it's pulling from is the unconscious. All this, all this stuff's coming up out of the basement. You say, oh, I just thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Look how smart I am. So no, the unconscious is working on it, and it shoots it upstairs. So there really is this powerful relationship between the social or the structural uh, and the unconscious. And so part of the thing, I think, is for us to stop having this divide, that mm -hmm. I'm going to just will myself to be a better person. Uh, most neuroscience say you can't do it. Um, and yet there's some things you can do. You can put yourself into a situation and with people that help you be a better person. We actually need each other. Everybody needs a body. So I read the book Thinking Fast and Slow too, and I felt that it changed my life. But it didn't change my behavior. It just helped me to be more aware. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's a great book. I recommend that too. But I want to come back to what we're talking about because these things have been divided. We have consultants who work on the personal, mm -hmm. and then we have organizations that work on the structural. And I'm wondering, as we really get serious about solidarity, and I'm struck now because everything I do and that we do at PolicyLink is about being serious about the outcomes and the results that we want, and that really focuses you. Right. Once you start calling out your results, you get focused on how it is you are going to hold yourself accountable to get someplace. And so my question, I'm ask, going to ask you the same question I just asked you, but I'm going to ask it harder. Um, because I'm wondering if we can't really build the kind of solidarity that we can depend on if it's not real, whether those of us who need solidarity for societal change, for campaigns, for advocacy efforts that we're in, can we afford to pay so little attention to the personal work that happens? Because we have left the personal work to people who aren't focused on our struggle. They may be focused on trying to be good people, but they're not focused on our struggle, and therefore sometimes their training doesn't translate. No, I, I think that's right. I think, um, and again, I'll push it a little bit. Okay. There's, a, there's a Jerry Butler, 
Uh, some of you may know him as the Iceman. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you may not know him at all. Uh, <laughs> but he has a song, and he, he says, a man needs to belong to someone. Mm -hmm. A man needs to be known by someone. And what he's saying is that we need to be seen. And so, yes, and, and there are people who see us and love us with our imperfections. Uh, and they may not completely understand us. Um, and then there are people who deny that we're people. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, we need solidarity, and we need it at multiple levels, and we need it in the family. And that's why if you don't have a base where you belong, you don't have solidarity in your family, I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, some of you, I talk about my family a lot. My, my father is 97. My sister is taking care of him. Uh, she's in her 70s. She just had uh, toes cut off. She has um, uh, diabetes. diabetes. Uh, and so her niece is saying, Mom, you got to come home with me to Georgia. You can no longer take care of grandfather. You know, you're too old, you're too neat. And, and she, then she found out she had heart condition, mm. a kidney condition. And so we had a family meeting. And, uh, and my niece said, we not got to make an intervention because mom is not getting it. She won't leave. And this is what my sister said. She said, I'm not leaving. If I'm at all able, I'm not leaving. And she said, when my mother died, our mother died, I made a promise to her. I made a promise to uh, my father, our father. I made a promise to God, and I made this promise to myself that as long as my father is alive and I'm able, I will take care of him. So that's solidarity. And it's, it's like the arc, and she's saying, and, and when we were talking, my, when my niece was saying, we got to make this intervention, I said, no, because this is not just her showing up, this is who she is. Mm -hmm. She ain't going nowhere if she's <laughs> able to stay there. Uh, and so, what happens is we have these relationships that are fragile. It's like, I'm with you for this march. Mm -hmm. I'm with you as long as I'm at the foundation. I'm just with you as long as you got money. But if times get hard, who's with you? Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We need to know that both at a personal level and an institutional level and a structural level, I ain't going nowhere. And that's what you gave to Fred. <laughs> I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. just, you know, it's like when people see you, and you, and you know they're going to be there. Uh, and I was right there behind my sister. I live in California. And I said, you know what, Barbara, if it's too much for you, I'll bring Dad out to California. They said, you ain't never home. How are you going to take care of <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I'd be home. And literally, mm -hmm. I would go back to Detroit if I had to, because that's solidarity. But solidarity, at its deepest sense, is not just showing up for someone. It's not just seeing someone. It's someone belongs. It's saying, I see you, and I love you. I see you, I love, and I am because you are. Mm -hmm. I am because you are. So it's not just doing this for you, I'm doing this for us. So uh, we don't have that. But I think the, what mm -hmm. you're trying to do and what you've right. been doing at Policy Link reflects that. And we certainly don't have it across race. No. Uh, because one of the things that the mayor was talking about, conservative whites in this country basically say, black. If black people are equal, if you believe you're better than someone, Heather McGee talks about this, if you believe you're better than someone, then equality sounds like I'm losing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be equal to black people. I want to be better than black people. The United States want to dominate. And that's what I, what I mean when I say we got we to gotta disrupt whiteness. You can't have solidarity with whiteness. Right. Mm -hmm. You can have it with white people, but not with whiteness. So I'm being told to stop, but let me tell you, but let me tell you, and it's not because of what you said. <laughs> I'm being told to stop, but I think that is such a provocative statement that I just want to give you 15 seconds to say a little bit more about it. <laughs> so whiteness is a concept. <laughs> it's a concept that was invented by the elites for domination for control, for separation. One reason it's so hard in the, in the country, and one reason that people literally, I mean, there were white people who said they couldn't get out of bed when Obama was elected president, uh, because they, their identity is bound up in dominance. When, Fred, when, when 
W.B. Du Bois said there's a psychological benefit to whiteness. And we keep missing that. We said we're going to give them more money, we're going to give them health care, we're going to give them housing. Truman, when he was president of the United States, he came this close to passing universal health care. Mm -hmm. And the South was on board, because the South needed health care more than anybody. And then at the 11th hour, they said, President Truman, we have a question to ask you. If we have universal health care, will we have to go to the hospitals with black people? <laughs> said, Truman said, want. yes. They said, we we'll be it. sick. We don't <laughs> want to go. We'll, we'd rather die. Okay. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, that, that, um, that it's whiteness. I mean, when we talk about race, people want to talk about black people, mm -hmm. or maybe brown people. But the hard edge of, and, and I'll end with this. Mm -hmm. I know we have time. James Baldwin said, it's no, it's no hope for them as long as they think they're white. So we got to get rid of this whiteness. And I don't mean, you know. I know exactly what you mean. In a loving way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>